Hey guys, it's Liana, and I'm here today to talk about The Witcher series by Andrzej Sapkowski. Yeah, it's a lot of books. And I've read them all, but not kind of all in one go. I read the... These uh, in 2018. And then this year I read Tower, or I finished, I started Tower of Swallows in 2019. And I finished it this year. And then I just finished Lady of the Lake. And this is a lot of freaking books. So I don't think I need to hold them up. You know what we're talking about. Um, I have not read Season of Storms. That's the only one that I haven't read. That one came out very recently and it takes place before even The Last Wish. It's like a pre pre prequel. So I will get to that at some point, but I regard this as kind of like the official Witcher series as it was until very recently. So yeah, what did I think of it? I have extremely mixed feelings about it. And given my history of pissing off hardcore fans of things, um, I anticipate that whatever I say in this video, I'm going to piss somebody off because I did not think it was perfection. So, you know, come at me and tell me I'm an idiot woman. Go for it. That's what y'all like to do. I thought it started out really strong. And then the ending is where I started to feel mixed about it. <laughs> overall, I would say that I think it's a good series. Overall, I would say that I do not regret reading it at all. And I do recommend the series to people. Like, without uh, reservations, I recommend it. But in terms of enjoyment of the reading experience and in terms of the strength of the writing, I feel like it tapered off towards the end. I, I was really into it. I really loved The Last Wish and The Sword of Destiny. I loved Blood of Elves. I love Time of Contempt. I love Baptism of Fire. And then Tower of Swallows, I was pretty bored. <laughs> and then Lady of the Lake, I was just kind of scratching my head a lot. And not because I was, I was confused and not, I didn't, I don't mean I was confused like I didn't understand it. I just kind of didn't understand why I was being told things when I was being told them in the order I was being told them or like why it was important to know them at all. Like I understood what was going on. I was just like, why are you telling me this? I, I don't get why. Not that I don't get it. It's a really long series and there's a lot to it. So I, this video can't, wouldn't even be spoilery if I wanted it to be because like to go into spoilers for this, what is five core books and then the two prequel kind of novella bind up type short story situation because that's kind of, if you don't know anything about Witcher series, the official kind of saga starts with Blood of Elves, then it's Time of Contempt, then it's Baptism of Fire, then Tower of Swallows, and then Lady of the Lake. So those are like the five core books, but you're supposed to read The Last Wish and The Sword of Destiny before Blood of Elves. So I've read all of those <laughs> and I've heard people complain that The Last Wish and The Sword of Destiny feels disjointed because it's kind of more a series of vignettes and short stories kind of introducing you to the concept of what a witcher is and introducing you to the world of the witcher and kind of the various characters that come into play at some point, the places and the politics. It's kind of an introduction into the world without having really an overarching plot. And I didn't mind that at all. I enjoyed it because I really liked the world and I really liked Geralt's character and I was into it. <laughs> it had a lot of dark humor in it, and I didn't mind that it would seem kind of directionless because it was kind of monster of the week type setup, which I was fine with. And then the core books that, that take you on this saga that do have an overarching plot that begins with Blood of Elves. At first, I was into it. At first, <laughs> this core story had my attention and interest. And again, you still had the kind of monster of the week type situations here and there, but I really loved getting to know the characters more. I, to this day, when I talk about this series with people, when I try to convince them to read it or I talk about what I loved best about it, one of the things that I loved best about it was Geralt with Little Siri, the rough and gruff and over the hill warrior witcher raising a little precocious princess. <laughs> it's so funny and also so authentic and genuine and and I that I loved so so much and I'm very upset that in the show Siri is already basically an adult when Geralt meets her because you're not gonna get Geralt and little Siri which is I fucking love it. <laughs> I love it so so much. Yeah there's so there was a lot of things about the series but other than that too that I liked there's so many female characters featured prominently in the story as significant political movers and shakers, as some of them are conniving, some of them are benevolent, some of them are kind. Like there's a as great a variety in the representations of females as there is of males, which is refreshing in fantasy in particular, especially a Polish fantasy written in the 90s. If anyone, if I was gonna give anyone a pass for kind of not representing females all that well, I would probably give something written in the 90s in Poland a pass. But 
I didn't need to give this a pass because women are strongly featured, heavily featured, prominently and frequently featured in this series. They are significant. They're not just like in there to have a token female. They're not just in there to have a token damsel. Like there are so many female characters in this in this series. And I love the shit out of that, like the fact of that. Again, they're not all the same. There's a huge diversity. It's not like they're all schemers or all, all anything. They're complicated and varied, just like male characters, which is... Good job. Again, a lot that I like about this series. I really enjoy the juxtaposition of Geralt with Dandelion. He that's funny, just like I mean it's funny in the show, but it's different in the books. Um, because Geralt is different in the books. And I didn't really mean to make this a video comparing the book to the show, but now that the show is out, I can't not do that. Geralt to me is not like a hot guy, <laughs> like he is on the show, because he's played by Henry Cavill. And Henry Cavill, don't get me wrong, he is fine. <laughs> and he looks great as Geralt. Sure. But it doesn't look like Geralt to me. To me, the person who should have played Geralt to be the way that I pictured Geralt would be Carl Urban. If you're not familiar with Carl Urban, he's the actor, he's one of the lead actors in The Boys, which is the Amazon show. And he's also Bones in the, the movie versions of Star Trek by J.J. Abrams. He's also in Lord of the Rings, the actor who plays Elmer. So he's been in some other stuff. You may have seen him. He, particularly his character in The Boys, you just put a white wig on that, give him a sword instead of a gun. That's Geralt. That's how I picture him. Kind of gruff and a little bit uncouth and just more grizzled. Really, really grizzled. Henry Cavill, yeah, they grizzled him up a little bit, but he's still too pretty. Like, he's really, really pretty. You know what I mean? That's kind of one of the things that I loved about this book series, too, is that Geralt's character, he isn't a starry-eyed, heroic, noble knight figure like you get in a lot of heroic traditional fantasy. He's also not what you find in Abercrombie, where in Abercrombie books, everybody is just kind of like a shit human who has like no moral compass whatsoever. Geralt has a moral compass. It's just his own moral compass. And he doesn't really give a shit about what your moral compass is. He has his own ideas of what's right and wrong. That can make him appear to have no moral compass when you don't agree with his decisions or you don't get why he's making the decisions he's making. But it's not like he is heartless. His just, his position on things is his own position on things. And he's not naive and he's not idealistic, but he does have a sense of right and wrong that has his own sense of right and wrong. And he kind of lives by that. And he's not going to patiently explain it to you. <laughs> and he's not going to respect your position on things. He's not that kind of guy either. So I just, I found Geralt's character to be a lot more layered and interesting than he seems to be on the show so far. And his character, the fact that he, you know, he does sleep with a lot of women in the books. There's a lot of sex in the books. <laughs> Surprisingly, a lot of sex in the books. But it's not like a romance novel type of sex. And it's not like Abercrombie sex either, because there's sex in Abercrombie books, and it is just as grim, dark, and like, yikes, <laughs> as all of the battle and the blood and the violence. The sex in the Witcher books is sometimes romantic, sometimes not, sometimes extremely like idealized and magical, and sometimes kind of because you felt like it. <laughs> so, so Geralt does sleep with a lot of women in the books, yeah, or in the books. Plural. And I feel like I've heard people complain that they don't like that about the portrayal of his character where like all the women are just like falling over themselves to sleep with him. Because that's not really how it came across to me. It just came across to me as a lot of powerful people who all have urges and needs. And Geralt is, you know, a virile man and he's there. And these women, it's not like they're lusting after him only, but you know, he's interesting and he's exciting and he's physically powerful. So why the fuck not? <laughs> it didn't strike me as like, these, all these damsels who are just like so like wetting their panties over Geralt. It was more like other strong female characters seeing this strong male character and you know, why not? <laughs> it felt pretty balanced and equal to me. I didn't feel like it was sexist. I guess it's what I'm trying to say. It didn't feel sexist because the women were also sleeping around with dudes other than Geralt. <laughs> it's not like he's the only one getting laid around here. So yeah, all of the complicated, interesting characters, and there's a lot of like complicated, interesting politics and, and world building, the way the magic comes into it, the way that this is getting into a little bit something spoilery, so I guess warning, but there is kind of almost like a His Dark Materials parallel universes type thing that kind of comes into it, which is kind of when it started to lose me, but I still think it's a cool concept, but I don't know that to me, I don't know that Andrei Sapkowski knew exactly what he wanted to do with that as a concept. As a, It seemed to me that it was thrown in there as like a, isn't that interesting? Just on its own. And it is, but like, what's the point of that? Because it does kind of begin to cross over and bleed over and into making you, 
ask questions about what universe this is taking place in or not taking place in. Which again, as a concept, yeah, cool. But I don't think enough was done with it to justify having it in there. Mm, as if, I don't know if that's fair to say. Y'all are probably already shitting on me in the comments for saying that, but whatever, that's how I felt about it. A lot of people don't like Yennefer and I don't get why Geralt is so into Yennefer specifically. However, I never have a problem with that. Like people complain about Name of the Wind and say they don't get why Quoth's into Denna. When people complain about the Gentleman Bastard series and say they don't get why Locke is so into Sabatha. I don't care. I'm not the one that's into those women. It's just important to the character. And so if it's believable to me that Geralt is into Yennefer, I don't have to love Yennefer. He loves Yennefer. So it's a story about him, not about me. So I don't have to think she's amazing. I don't have to be in love with her. It's significant to Geralt's character that he's in love with Yennefer and it defines a lot of his choices and it doesn't have to make sense to me. Love doesn't make sense. So yeah, so I don't have a problem with that. Like I don't, I don't see what's so great about her, but I don't need to see what's so great about her. So I don't care if that makes sense. It's, it doesn't bother me that Geralt's in love with Yennefer. Like, great, that's who he's in love with, fine. <laughs> Yennefer's character is, again, a layered and interesting and complicated character. Which, again, I think Andrew Sapkowski handles women fairly well in this series. Not flawlessly, but fairly well. And Ciri's character, I liked a lot at first. But the story stopped being about Geralt right around Tower of Swallows and Lady of the Lake and became kind of entirely about Ciri. And Ciri is important. Of course she's important. And I, I want her to be prominently featured in the story. And she was prominently featured to begin with. It was always clear that she was linked with Geralt, a child surprise, linked by destiny, blah, blah, blah. Like, we know this. But it got to the point where towards the end of the series, I was like, why is Geralt even here? Why even have him at all? Why call this the Winter series? Because he's hardly in it. And I guess that's kind of my issue with it. I was like, then I felt a little bit cheated in terms of the naming of the series. I was like, why aren't, why don't you call this like the Chronicles of Princess Cirilla or something? Because it's more about her than it is about Geralt. Geralt's just like also there. And in the way that it keeps being forced down our throats, that they are linked by destiny and how important Geralt and Ciri are, like in terms of fate and destiny. I, by the end, I was like, I, yeah, they ended up being tied, but not in a way that really, it didn't live up to all the buildup because the books all from the beginning are building up this, this destiny, this fate that they're all marching towards where Geralt and Ciri are inextricably linked. And it's just like, at the end, I was like, eh, just, eh are they linked? They were around each other a lot and they ended up doing stuff that affected the other, but eh, eh. so by the end of the books, I was starting to miss Geralt. I was like, where the fuck is Geralt? I thought this was the Witcher series. Where is the fucking Witcher? And I, it's not like I didn't want Ciri in it. I didn't want it to be like 80% Geralt with like Ciri also there, but it turned into 80% Ciri with like Geralt also there. I wanted it to be more even. It could be, if it's the Witcher series and it's about Geralt, which is apparently what it's supposed to be, according to how it's named and how it's sold and how it's pitched. Um, maybe make it 60 Geralt and like 40 Ciri, you know? Like, where is the Witcher? <laughs> so overall, I enjoy the series. Overall, it's a good read. Overall, it's doing some really interesting things with magic and world building and politics. And there were times, again, towards the later books where it wasn't even about Ciri. It was not about Geralt or Ciri. We would off-road into like other parts of the world where it's just like suddenly giving me a bunch of politics and history lessons on other parts of the world, which is significant to what's generally going on and into the, the diplomatic and political and, and battle decisions that are taking place in the world that affect Geralt and Ciri. It was just kind of so much off-roading into not our main characters that it made me feel quite detached. And even the way that it's told, even when we are talking about Geralt and Ciri, the narration could feel quite detached at times. So that I guess was somewhat of a criticism, but for the most part, that didn't bother me. It really only started to bother me in the later books when I kind of lost the feeling of being connected to the story and being connected to these characters in the way that I felt very connected and really interested and very invested. I was very into it in the beginning, into Geralt's character, into Ciri's character, into seeing how they were linked, into seeing where all this is going, into the politics, into the history. But it's just kind of like a bit like with George R. R. Martin's books, which is kind of, again, how I feel about them and feel free to shit on me for this too. I feel really connected to George R. R. Martin's characters in the beginning books. But then by the time we get to like Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons, it's just like so all over the place that I'm just like, who am I following anymore? Do I care? Where are my main characters? That's, and then the, again, without spoilers, the way that the series ends is 
It's the best word. It's a bit underwhelming. <laughs> Again, and that's more because of how the series itself keeps building. If the series didn't so frequently talk about fate and destiny and where all this is leading, then it wouldn't matter to me. Because again, I love Abercrombie and Abercrombie books, he seems to take a perverse pleasure in ending things in a way that you're just like, what? That's how it ends? What the fuck? I love Abercrombie books, so it's not a problem for me. But if a book's gonna keep telling me that destiny and fate and destiny and fate are like such a big fucking deal and that this is the Witcher series and destiny and fate. And then by the last book, I'm just like, sorry, what destiny, what fate? Where's the fucking Witcher? So again, overall, I think it's a very interesting and unique and pretty exceptional series, honestly. There's a lot of stuff that Andrzej Sapkowski has done here that is incredible. Like Tolkien level complexity to world building, like George R. R. Martin level of complexity of family trees and lineages and interweaving of destiny and whatever. Like it's a lot there. And overall, I'm impressed and in the beginning books was also very much enjoying it. It seemed to me to kind of get away from him a bit and you can even kind of see that when you look at the books and you look at how fucking long Lady of the Lake is as compared to the earlier books, it just started to feel like he had too many threads and too many ideas that he hadn't had time to explore yet and needed to like get in there to the point where I was like, you've lost the plot. <laughs> can we get back to the main plot? <laughs> so yeah, it was stuff like that where it's just like, you are spending so much time on this other stuff now that You've, you're kind of losing me and you need to get back to the main story, which is again how I feel about Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons with Song of Ice and Fire. I'm pointing this way because that's where my Song of Ice and Fire books are behind me. So again, to sum up, overall, I think there's a lot to like here and I am very impressed with the, the characters he's written, the prose he's written, a lot of good humor, honestly. There's a lot of really, you know, kind of dark gallows humor in here, which is my taste and I really like it. A lot of interesting weaving in of other folklore and fairy tales and familiar concepts and kind of taking familiar concepts and turning them on their head. He does a lot of like subversion of traditional depictions of fantastical and fantasy and, and fairy tale type characters and creatures. Having something like a vampire and then doing things with it that are unexpected and that subvert your expectations for what a vampire is supposed to be in a story. Or taking traditional fairy tales like Beauty and the Beast and kind of flipping them on their head and making, turning them into a grimdark adventure for Geralt. Like there's a lot in there in this series that I really, really like, that I'm really impressed by. And that I, that's why I continue to recommend the series. But by the end, it gets a bit long and it gets a little bit kind of wrapped up in itself too much. And I think it could be tightened a bit because <laughs> he's, also publishing all these other kind of offshoot novellas and things like that. So I feel like if there's this, there are, I can see why some of the things that are being kind of told and like mixed into like Tower of Swallows and Lady of the Lake, where we've suddenly left both Geralt and Ciri and Yennefer and we're not with any of our main characters anymore and we're learning about some other part of this world and some other history about this world. I see why you kind of feel like the readers need to know about this. I just feel like there are more organic ways to deliver this information without having to completely take us out of the main story for a history lesson is kind of how it feels like. I just feel like it could be tightened up a bit. And if you wanted to have all that extra content where we were actually seeing these events and actually being told about these events, you could release a companion book. <laughs> I've said this, I've criticized other books and said that an author should probably have done that. And I have been called a dumb female and many worse things for saying that, but that's how I feel. And I think that's what would improve the books for me. Other people think these are perfect the way they are. So whatever. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read the Witcher series, if you have just watched the show and were thinking about picking up the books, if you have just played the games and were thinking about picking up the books. I have never played the games. I did watch the show. I watched the show after having read everything apart from Lady of the Lake and then read Lady of the Lake. So my image of this world and these characters was formed well before the show came out, which is why watching the show, I could enjoy the show for itself, but the show isn't really anything like I pictured. Not the characters, not the setting, not really any of it. So the show is fun and I enjoy the show, but the show to me is almost nothing to do with the Witcher books because it's so different. Anyway, yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I post videos on Saturdays, sometimes Wednesdays, so like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you.